If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Also, after watching this video, you may want to refer to some of the playlists that we have created for people who are interested in in-depth knowledge. These are the videos in the right sequence, which will give you thorough knowledge of the subject. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. If you are a practitioner or a student of data science, then one topic that becomes really important for you is known as the ensembling. You cannot avoid ensembling if you want to do some real world problem solving or if you want to participate in competitions. Basically, if you want to do something credible in data science, you need to know about ensembling. Now, at least at the time when I'm making this video, I can assure you there is no other video that gives you the kind of clarity that this video is going to offer you on this topic of ensembling. So keep watching this video till end and it'll answer a lot of questions that you probably have. And it'll also expose you to certain other extensions that you need to know from a practical point of view. Let's start with what is ensembling. So we'll go by the dictionary definition of ensembling. It can be used both as a noun and a verb. A group of items viewed as a whole rather than individually. In the context of ensemble learning, it refers to a group of models of predictors whose individual predictions are combined to make a final prediction. Now, have you come across situations in life when you had to make a really tough decision and you really needed guidance or opinion of some of your mentors or guides? It happens with all of us. Why do you seek a second opinion? You seek a second opinion because that kind of gives you a confidence. You reach out to maybe multiple people that you trust with their knowledge who have done what you're trying to do in the past and these people give you the enlightenment or the knowledge that helps you make informed and better decisions. Now exactly same is the reason why you may do ensembling in machine learning. You may be dealing with the data which is quite complex and in order to solve a complex problem, you may not necessarily want to bank on just one type of algorithm. You may take opinion of multiple algorithms that are available. After all, all the machine learning algorithms are there to help solve problems. So why can't we use more than one of them? That is what ensembling does. As a verb, it talks about bringing together or organizing a group or system. That essentially is what you will see in the subsequent slides. But let's understand why we need ensembling. To give you a little bit of a background, we are showing you a figure which is pointing towards error on the y-axis and the model complexity on the x-axis. Now, as you can see, if the model complexity is low, we have a very high error called bias error. Now, what is this bias error? This leads to a problem called underfitting. This is when you are not able to make a good model out of the given data. So as you continue to make the model more and more complex, the bias error continues to reduce. Is that good? Not really. We actually have to do a trade-off between the high bias error to low bias error. Why? Because at the same time, when you looked at the bias error reducing, you could see another type of error, which is called the variance error. It goes up. Now, what does it mean? Variance error essentially represents the error that your model will face if the underlying data was to be changed. Please understand the whole premise in case of machine learning is that you're using the past data to be able to make meaningful decisions for the future. Now, if you're not able to make meaningful decisions on the future data, then your entire analysis is useless. So while the bias error continued to reduce here, the variance error continued to go up. Again, if the model was simple, the variance error was very low. But if the model becomes more and more complex, the variance error goes up. So is this better or is this better? Well, neither. We want a trade-off between these. So putting the bias and variance errors together, we have the total error. And we want the total error to be minimized. Neither we want to be underfitting with the high bias error, nor we want to be overfitting with the high variance error. We want to be settling for the optimal value. So once again, quickly revisiting the definition of bias and variance for you, Bias is the error introduced by approximating a real-world problem leading to underfitting. You have a high bias error here. Whereas variance is the amount by which the model's predictions would change if it were trained on a different data set leading to overfitting. This is the case of overfitting. We want to be trading off somewhere in between. Then what is the connection with ensembling here? Ensembling essentially helps you bring the low bias and low variance in place. 
low bias could be achieved by overfitting a model, by extending a decision tree to its last leg. But low variance would be achieved only if your model remains stable even when the underlying data is changed. So the whole idea of ensembling is to give stable and reliable models. The models that do not begin to give adverse results when the underlying data changes. Because it's a fact that the test data or the real world data that the model will be exposed to in future could be a little different from the historical data. But as a result, we don't want to be seeing huge changes, drifts, in the model performance. That's where you need ensembling. Now let's understand with the help of a proper mind map what all broad categories or options are available within ensembling. So there are three broad categories. The first set represents the parallel ensembling techniques. The second set is the sequential and the third one is a composite or hybrid which is a mix of both parallel and sequential. Now you're going to see some familiar terms very soon and we'll just talk about them quickly here. So what are parallel ensembling techniques? There are two broad categories, bagging and voting-based techniques. Let's understand each of these one by one. So let's talk about bagging first. So bagging basically stands for bootstrap aggregating. It's derived from the two words, bootstrap and aggregating or aggregation. And the underlying concept in bagging is that you use the same type of base model. A very popular example of bagging is a random forest model. What does it do? It uses multiple decision trees under the hood. And then finally, at the time of decision, it combines the result of those decision trees and gives you an answer. So the underlying type of model is one and the same, which is a decision tree. It may be using 100 decision trees to come up with an answer. But these decision trees are trained on different subsets of the data. So there are two angles that we are looking at constantly when we explain these techniques. First is the type of model and the second is the data. Type of model is same in case of bagging, but the underlying data keeps on changing. Now, how do you change the data? You could do that by selecting a subset of the data in terms of rows. You may select rows with or without replacement. You may also select a subset of columns. So you may do a mix of features and mix of rows, either one of these or maybe both put together. That's called bagging. At a high level, that's what you need to understand now and we'll dig deeper as we continue to build further. But why do we call it parallel? It's parallel because all the decision trees are independent of each other. Decision tree is just an example. You could take any other machine learning model and do this exercise. It's just an example here right now. The decision trees or the base models that you take are not influenced by each other. They are independent of each other. You want them to be as different as possible because if you were to take the identical decision trees in a random forest, you will end up making one and the same decision. What's the point of creating multiple trees if all the trees are identical? You want the trees to differ. And that's the whole idea of padding. Next, we move on to voting. Again, the two dimensions, models and data. In voting, we use different types of models. So you may be using a logistic regression model along with a k-nearest neighbor model or a naive base model or a decision tree model. You could try different types of models. How does it vary in terms of data? Each model is trained on the full training data, but the predictions are combined through voting. So if you dig deeper into this, you'll realize that in case of voting algorithms, let's say you're solving a classification problem, you combine all the decisions of different models and make a decision finally based on the voting. In case of regression problems, it will simply be an average that you have to predict. Now let's move on to sequential models. In this category, we have boosting models. And we've done a sequence of videos on these boosting models where we've explained the adaptive boosting and gradient boosting models. And there are a couple of more models like extreme gradient boosting, etc. But let's understand what these are. So in boosting, the models are of same type, but the models learn sequentially. This is important. In parallel ensembling techniques, the models were independent of each other. But in sequential ensemble techniques, the models are built sequentially, where each subsequent model focuses more on correcting the errors made by the previous models. That's the main difference. Now, what is the composite approach? Within the composite approach, you will hear two broad categories, blending and stacking. Now, what are these? In blending and stacking, again, we use different types of models. 
but we use a combination of sequential and parallel approaches. This will become clearer when we explain it to you in the subsequent videos, but understand this, you use a combination of both the techniques. You do some amount of parallel models where the models are independent of each other. So let's say you do logistic regression, naive bays, and decision trees, three models which are parallel. They are not connected to each other, but then you use a meta model which utilizes the predictions made by these base models and makes the final prediction. So the predictions of the base model are used as features for a meta model because the meta model is utilizing the information or the predictions made by the previous models, it becomes sequential. So the parallel nature of blending and stacking is limited to the point where you talk about the base models. Those are parallel, but as you build more layers or you give this input to the meta model, that becomes sequential. That's why this comes under the composite techniques. This video was necessary to give you the foundation relative to what we're going to share with you next. So hope this at least gets you initiated and you'll be more comfortable as we explain and dig deeper into each of these techniques in future.